If you've been following me and my channel for longer than, say, 47 seconds, then you know that I love Star Trek. Star Trek has consistently been my source of inspiration, showing me a future where humanity takes delight in the differences and diversity of others. A show full of interesting characters, rich worlds, and deep lore, and, and a love of exploration. Let's see what's out there. Engage. A show and franchise that extols the belief that humanity will overcome the worst parts of ourselves as we begin to pursue and cultivate in complete earnest the best parts of ourselves. But also, Star Trek is fucking weird. Like demonic space clown weird. Why talk when we can dance? Like planet full of half-naked sexy people who will constantly rub oil on you but will also fucking murder you if you step on a very specific piece of grass. Weird. What punishment? Name it. Death, of course. Don't make it difficult for the boy. Like whatever the hell this is kind of weird. <sighs> will I get demonetized for that? But as you can see, Star Trek is often a franchise of contradictions. It's often inspiring and progressive, yet sometimes woefully offensive and silly and strange. What does God need with a starship? Jim, what are you doing? I'm asking you a question. It can be thoughtful. It is possible to commit no mistakes and still lose. That is not a weakness. That is life. And it can be juvenile. Sex. I beg your pardon. And yet, all of it is part of what it means to be Star Trek. And I think of all the Trek shows, of which there are many, 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 I think there is one, above all, that truly understands the totality of what Star Trek is. All the joys and eccentricities of my favorite franchise. And it's a show that asks you a simple question. What if you didn't follow these bridge crew jerks, but these guys? Nah. Lower Congrats, decks, man. Lower decks, cool. Teamwork, no. spirit, no, 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 community. No, 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 lower deck, lower <laughs> deck. <laughs> yes, I'm talking about Star Trek Lower Decks. If the costume didn't give away and the body paint that took way too long and the failure of me trying to dye my hair green. I, I tried, people. I really tried. But seriously, I'm talking about Star Trek Lower Deck. Lower, di lower Dicks? Lower Decks. Star Trek Lower Decks, not Lower Dicks. That's a different show. Very different show. Still watch it though. Jamma Haron! This boy wants Jamma Haron! <laughs> I think Star Trek Lower Decks is a show that I think many people, Trekkies and non-Trekkies alike, may have missed or even completely dismissed because it was Star Trek's first animated comedy. Something that on the surface might seem antithetical to what Star Trek should be. But surprisingly, I think Lower Decks is actually more true to Star Trek than any other Trek show before it, and exemplifies the best of Trek, and has become my favorite realization of everything I love about Star Trek in only a simple first season that's been released. It has the weirdness and insanity, yet it has the ever-present earnest spirit of kindness, caring, and optimism that feels uniquely Star Trek. So, since I honestly need a break from the harder topics we've been talking about on this channel, and because season two of Lower Decks is about to premiere in just a week or so, and also because I just want an excuse to try and test out my Ensign Tendi cosplay, which, again, didn't do the hair perfectly, but I think the rest of it kind of came out pretty good. I want to tell you why you should, whether you're a lifelong Trekkie or have never seen an episode of Star Trek, should watch Star Trek Lower Decks and see why it's one of my favorite shows in my favorite franchise. Though, to be fair, it still has yet to have that tentacle monster porn, so still room for improvement. The story of Star Trek Lower Decks begins where all the most inspiring of humanity stories begin. On Twitter, the creator of Lower Decks, Mike McMahon, had grown up inspired by Star Trek The Next Generation, enthralled with the adventures of a bald British man playing a French starship captain who loved to speechify about every issue and cosplay as Robin Hood from time to time. McMahon also loved comedy, having worked as an assistant at famed Chicago improv comedy theater Second City, and then for nearly a decade as a production and writer's assistant on numerous animated comedy shows like South Park and Drawn Together. You know, when I was talking about how I worked all those Lower Decker gigs is I was always excited to be doing anything on shows to see how they actually got made, because every show is different. Yeah, while Mike McMahon was working in the lower decks of the writer's room, he wanted to try something fun at home. Jamaharon! This boy wants Jamaharon! 
In October 2011, he created a Twitter account called Star Trek The Next Generation Season 8, where he tweeted out comedic pictures for episodes of non-existent Star Trek The Next Generation's Season 8. There is no chance I'll ever get to write for a Star Trek show, which is probably for the best. So instead, I created a Twitter account to write Star Trek episodes that would make my geeky wife laugh. And the Twitter account became so popular with Trekkies as a result that Mike pitched and made a book version of the Twitter account in 2015, which parodied actual Star Trek episode guides that had been released with almost every single Star Trek show up to that point. But to Mike, this seemed like this was going to be the closest he ever got to Star Trek because in 2017, Mike became one of the first writers on Rick and Morty, a show that finally seemed to capture that alchemy of science fiction and comedy that Mike loved so much, and finally took Mike from the Lower Decks to the writing team bridge crew. It was Justin Roiland, Dan Harmon, Ryan Ridley, and me. And it was us sitting in a room every day, me taking notes, and occasionally, like, fearfully pitching a joke. And from there, I became writer's assistant on the full first season. And then I got to write an episode at the end of that season because I'd been, you know, working with the guys long enough that they kind of recognized that I was a big sci-fi geek and a comedy geek and that I could do it. Second season, I got moved up. And then eventually, by fourth season, uh, I was showrunner because mm -hmm. I just, you know, I really... I really got, you know, I liked Dan and Justin's vision for the show, and I really liked writing the show. I really liked that stuff. He even eventually became a showrunner for Rick and Morty and got his own sci-fi animated comedy show on Hulu called Solar Opposites, which was created with fellow Rick and Morty writer Justin Roiland. Yet, despite his success, McMahon seemed to believe that his time with the Star Trek world was over. Enter Alex Kurtzman. <laughs> bane of every neck beard on YouTube and the man who's been fired so many times that it's kind of ridiculous at this point. And more seriously, the executive producer currently in charge of the Star Trek franchise, who, after having been made aware of Mike McMahon's Trek fandom by a mutual friend, called McMahon into a conversation to ask Mike what he saw as a potential Star Trek comedy series. To which Mike pitched to him basically, you know those slots in the Enterprise where the food comes out? I want to make a show about the people who make those slots work. To which Alex Kurtzman presumably said, You son of a bitch, I'm in. And also, if you believe certain parts of YouTube and 4chan, he probably also said, And then my evil plan to destroy Star Trek and the childhood memories of all Trekkies, and specifically that one guy on YouTube, will finally be completed. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, he's just a dude trying to do his job, but, you know. But anyways, Mike McMahon, the guy who had worked his way from Star Trek The Next Generation fan to backstage crew member of a sketch comedy theater to writer's assistant fetching coffee to tweet writer to show writer, finally got something he never thought he would. A Star Trek show. At first glance, Star Trek Lower Decks feels like it's just a pastiche of Star Trek, and specifically Star Trek The Next Generation. Everything, including the tricorders, Klingon batlets, phasers, the sets, and the corridors even, feel like, if not for being animated, like they could have been physically made by Star Trek's art department, barely scraping by with its limited budget back in the 80s. The animation even captures that cheap makeup look that Star Trek has always had, with many of the aliens just looking like dudes with weird shit glued on their noses, because... That's what most of Star Trek aliens were, dudes with weird shit glued on their noses. Permit me to express my appreciation to you and your crew. Even the visual aesthetic, from the camera angles, to the credits, to logos, to music, all feels incredibly 90s Star Trek. The design of the USS Cerritos itself, the main ship of the series, feels like it was kit bashed together. A process where production designers on old Trek series would just take different parts of ship models that they had lying around and break them apart and smash them together to create new ships for different battles and things like that. Now, I know all this seems like kind of a duh, of course they would recreate the look of Star Trek, but keep in mind, this is an animated show. They could have done anything they wanted to. I mean, look at a single frame of the similarly animated Rick and Morty, and you can see the diversity of design and alien looks that that show manages to create. Really, Lower Decks could have emulated that style and could have done anything they wanted to with an animated format. And yet, the show still feels visually Trek. Even further, the show features a familiar cast of faces you'll find in every Star Trek series roster. The bold captain, the confident first officer, the grouchy doctor, the nerdy chief engineer, and the explosion-obsessed tactical officer. Please, please let me shoot their warp core. I have been very good this month. And all of that is incredibly, incredibly cool, especially for me as a Trekkie nerd. That's something I love about the show. 
But just a quick Star Trek aesthetic with a comedy exterior wouldn't really make Lower Deck special. I mean, there are endless Trek fan films that recreate this look, and we even have Seth MacFarlane's The Orville on the air right now, itself a comedic love letter to Star Trek The Next Generation. In fact, many of the Orville's plots are honestly just a slight comedic twist on existing The Next Generation episodes. It's an enjoyable show, don't get me wrong, I love The Orville, but it doesn't really do or say anything new with the Trek aesthetic. And that could have easily been what Lower Decks did, and it would have probably been enough to get people to watch it, just doing it with official Star Trek branding this time. But instead, Lower Decks does something deeper. It uses the framework of Trek that came before it to flip Star Trek around and examine the universe in a new way, from the bottom up, and then uses that to show us what Star Trek is really all about. Starting with the basics, like McMahon pitched, Star Trek Lower Decks does have that Star Trek bridge crew that we followed on every single Star Trek series. But instead of following them, it follows four Lower Deck ensigns. First glance, they may appear to be broad comedic stereotypes and just vehicles for humor that you see in every other animated show like Family Guy or something like that. I am Vindicta, vengeance personified. At last, free man, I will be bathe in your blood. Oh boy, somebody's really laying it on thick. But that really isn't the case here. Instead, while these characters are humorous, they instead feel relatable, realistic, and human, but heightened because of the Star Trek world that they exist in. And dear God, everyone, I love these characters so goddamn much. Let's start with Rutherford, played by Eugene Cordero, who is a half-cyborg engineer. He is literally how you would imagine every engineer in Starfleet is. That was like half a second faster than normal! I can't believe it's working! <gasps> He's just a hyper-competent nerd that just loves to get on his hands and knees and crawl around the inside of a Jeffrey's tube. Yet Rutherford becomes more human because he also showcases very human traits. A lot of insecurity, anxiety, and a need to please that many nerds who don't understand how good they are at something develop because of a lack of confidence and ability to read others. He even shows a distinct lack of social skills too, sometimes ignoring his dates or his friends for his hyperfixations. Your analysis estimates the reliability of this mechanism at 1 out of 4.69 repeating! Ugh. Oh, are you seeing this? And there's a whole discussion to be had about the relatable neurodivergent coding of Rutherford, and I'm so here for it, and I'm so here for him. But this brings me to Tendi. Oh god, my girl Tendi. I got to hold a heart! Tendi is a young medical officer and immediately from her first appearance grabbed my heart and kept pumping it. I am honestly not kidding when I say that Tendi may be one of my favorite characters in all of Star Trek, which given how much Star Trek there is and how much I have seen it and watched it over and over again throughout my entire life is saying something. Tendi literally feels like if a Trekkie from the real world was transported inside of the Star Trek world. She's just excited at every little thing around her, no matter how scary or insane or minute they are. Peanut hamper? I love it! just enthusiastic to learn and try new things as well, like when she literally genetically engineers her own dog for the fun of it. Yet because she's also a completely innocent baby, she gets the dog's DNA completely wrong, but yet oh, oh, oh so right. <gasps> oh wow, I'm so glad you're happy. Well, the dog, then I guess this is goodbye. Farewell, Tendi. May the suns shine upon you. Dear God, her dog literally talks and flies away, and I love it so much, and I love Tendi for making it. Yet my favorite quality of hers is that she's so endearingly optimistic all of the time in true Star Trek fashion. My favorite example of this is when Rutherford gets his memory erased in one of the series' most emotional moments. Tendi reacts not with sadness, but joy. Do you remember me at all? Well, no. But don't take it personally. I don't remember what I don't remember. <sighs> you know what this means, right? We get to become best friends! Oh! Okie dokie! Honestly, I can't explain to you when I watched that scene how much that moment meant to me. To just see someone in the face of tragedy take that and turn it into something exciting and beautiful and just honestly just so kind and optimistic. It's that kind of hopefulness that is just pure and absolute Trek and why I love Tendi so dang much. Yet, the other thing that I love about her is that she doesn't take shit from anyone and I love that. Tendi is from an alien species called Orions, who have only ever cropped up in previous Star Trek series as pirates or slavers, or slaves themselves. Yet when another character in the show constantly jokes about Tendi being a slave trader or a pirate, Tendi does not let that go unchallenged. Come on, dude! Orions are pirates! Pillaging your whole thing! Okay, stop! It is not my whole thing, and for your information, many Orions haven't been pirates for over five years! 
Here we can see that Tendi doesn't let anyone else to give her any crap about her people or stereotype her in any way. Yet, this is also a perfect example of what makes Lower Decks work on a different level than other Star Trek series, because it uses comedy to criticize yet uphold what Star Trek is. Using this example specifically, Star Trek as a franchise has constantly monocultured alien species, saying that every member of an alien race is somehow the same. All Vulcans are logical, all Klingons are warriors, for example. And Orions, as I said, are typically only seen as space pirates. Yet here Tendi is as a medical officer. Her mere existence comments on this Trek monocultural trope. Yet by also showing that the idea that all Orions are pirates is an actual stereotype within the world of Trek itself, Lower Decks is saying that the lens that we've typically viewed Star Trek through, constantly focusing on the bridge crew of starships and of Starfleet crew members, is actually a limited and biased one. That the stereotypes and biases of Trek's writings of the past are issues within the Trek universe itself. Uh, you know the whole Orion's taking slaves thing? It's not something I really like to... Dirty Orion. <gasps> Lundy! <laughs> And thereby, by showing us a different view, a lower decks view, a new viewpoint, is thus able to criticize these tropes within the Star Trek world itself, yet never break the canon of the show itself. Considering that Star Trek Lower Decks does take place in the same universe as all the other Star Trek shows. And this is a fine line to walk, as sometimes when you comment on a universe from within that universe, it's easy to break it in a way that makes it hard to reconstruct it. For example, look at Zack Snyder's Superman, which deconstructs what it means to be an all-powerful superhero in a nihilistic modern world. But in the process of talking about that, it makes it hard to see Henry Cavill's Superman as the inspiring and optimistic figure that Superman should be. It's why works like The Boys or Elseworlds like Red Sun deconstruct Superman better, using an outsider perspective on the franchise instead of actually breaking the character within the universe itself. Yet Lower Decks takes a different tact, analyzing the Star Trek universe from within that universe but is able to do so and uphold that universe without breaking it because it's just shifting the perspective. Yet Lower Decks isn't using its comedy just to criticize Star Trek, but using it as well to celebrate what Star Trek is. In one episode, Rutherford decides he wants to take on a new job in Starfleet, changing departments from engineering to command to tactical and medical. Each time he asks to change departments though, it seems like folks are going to be offended that he doesn't like his new job. And yet, they are always excited and supportive of him. I'd like to request a transfer out of engineering. Consider your request granted. Oh man, this is exciting. I'm sure wherever you end up, they'll be lucky to have you. Aw, thanks guys. I'm gonna miss you. It's a joke that's honestly funny because it's unexpected by today's standards, by our real standards today in our world. And yet, it feels like it's perfectly expected for the Star Trek universe, where people are constantly encouraged by others to try new things and grow. Here, Lower Decks is using its comedy in service of upholding, not destroying, the earnest optimism that makes Star Trek unique. The comedy of Lower Decks, in equal measure, is able to criticize Star Trek and the problems within it, as well as uphold what makes Star Trek unique and yet also being earnestly funny on top of all of that. Yet this intelligent writing is never made more clear than in the lead characters of Boimler and Mariner. And both Mariner and Boimler on their own are not just funny archetypes with interesting character flaws and benefits. They also show two sides of what it means to be Starfleet. Ensign Boimler is seemingly a perfect Starfleet ensign, always following the books, the exact letter of the Starfleet code. He's always on time for a shift, he works his butt off to get things done, he's always the top of his class, but as a result, he lacks the ability to improvise, to actually react to the nuances of a real-life situation. Trekkies, like Boimler, often like to think that Star Trek is this perfect organization whose rules are the perfect embodiment of what humanity should be. Yet this blind love of Starfleet often forgets all the times within the Star Trek show itself where Starfleet got it wrong, where things like the Prime Directive actually caused more harm than good. Even metatextually, sometimes the writers of Star Trek itself sometimes have believed a little bit too much in Starfleet's own inherent goodness, leading to episodes like Star Trek Enterprise's Dear Doctor, where Captain Scotty Batts used proto-Starfleet ideology to actually justify complicity in a genocide. What I've decided goes against all my principles. Which the episode writers apparently framed as the good option, for some reason. Star Trek Enterprise is a weird show, but heavens if I don't love it. And Boimler, being the stickler that he is for most of Lower Decks' first season, is the exact kind of Starfleet officer who lacks that self-analysis that sometimes Star Trek itself lacked. Mariner, on the other hand, seems exactly the opposite. 
She's always ready to break the rules, constantly subverting authority, and is quite possibly in line to be kicked out of Starfleet altogether if she continues to screw up. Now I have to explain why there's an interspecies war on a planet that was peaceful yesterday. Oh, so you're yelling at me for spreading freedom because you don't feel like filing a report? Ah! Mariner, I swear if you want my daughter, you'd be off the Cerrito. Yet you realize that part of the reason that she breaks the rules all the time isn't because she hates what Starfleet stands for, but because she sees the rules that Boimler loves so much as red tape getting in the way of Starfleet's actual goal of helping others and exploring the universe. In the series' very first episode, Mariner breaks Starfleet protocol to give alien farmers the tools they need to help grow their crops, tools that would have taken so much longer for them to get if they just went through Starfleet bureaucracy. However, while this is a good thing and something to be commended, the big problem with her character, though, is that she can't get out of her own way and constantly misjudges and thinks that she's a selfish person when she's really not. In the episode Much Ado About Boimler, Mariner is given a temporary first officer position, and yet constantly self-sabotages because she's afraid of promotion and responsibility, believing herself to be self-centered because she's so rebellious. Despite when the card's being down, she's always there to protect others, and is actually capable of leading well and caring about others. Got the best grades, you kept us all on track, now it seems like you don't even like Starfleet. She's like a Captain Kirk, the best type of Captain Kirk, just without the trust in her own goodness to think that she deserves to be captain. And hopefully without the sexist womanizing that Captain Kirk liked to do, too. But as a result, both Boimler and Mariner are two different types of Starfleet officers and ways that Star Trek has been presented in previous iterations. And this is interesting on its own, both as I said, criticizing and upholding what Star Trek has always been about. But Lower Decks takes this criticism and commentary and upholding of Starfleet and takes these characters and has them do something even further, something quintessentially Star Trek. It shows us how humanity can become better when we recognize our flaws and yet love our flaws as well, and shows that when we work together, we can better each other. Before I get to that though, I want to quickly mention some things about Lower Decks that I love that I couldn't really find anywhere else to fit in this script. I love that Lower Decks constantly makes specific references to other elements of Star Trek, like really, really specific references. Did Picard know about the Borg? Did Kirk know about that giant Spock on Phylos? Did Dr. Crusher know about that ghost in the lamp thing from the Scottish planet that she hooked up with that one time? That whole thing! Now, in my initial reviews of the show, that kind of bothered me because I thought it came off as the show appearing too fan servicey. But then I heard Mike McMahon's explanation of it. We get a lot of people being like, wow, there's a lot of references in this show. Mm -hmm. And some people misunderstand and think that we think that the references are funny. We don't think the references are funny. We feel like criminals who have gotten away with getting to do a Star Trek show and if, <laughs> and that the Lower Deckers would be huge fans of all the stuff that happened in Starfleet. They'd be learning about it at the Academy. They'd be reading the logs. And this show is a celebration of all Star Trek stuff for the characters in it and for the audience watching it and for the guys writing it. Um, and so, you know, we almost feel like we're like, oh, oh crap, we, we did it. We got a Star Trek show. Let's have as much fun as possible in it. Like all these references for us, it's, it's world building. Like these are animated two-dimensional characters. How could they not be excited about Gorn? Like if they know everything about this <laughs> ship, they would know everything about Starfleet. And honestly, that makes perfect sense to me. And I really like that he has a justification for it, that it wasn't just something that the writers were doing flippantly. I mean, as a Star Trek nerd, I felt the exact same way, just constantly wanting to reference Star Trek, especially as a kid, wanting to rattle off as many Star Trek references as I could, but since I was the only sci-fi geek in my school, I never got to have an excited audience to listen to. In fact, most people just looked at me if I referenced even Seven of Nine as, like, if I was a weirdo, which, to be fair, I am, but not for referencing Seven of Nine. She's, like, one of the most popular characters in Star Trek. But Lower Decks as a show finally gives me, as a Trekkie, that outlet. But the other reason that I was worried in my initial review with the references is that I thought that they might be a little bit off-putting to those who had only ever seen Lower Decks, but never any other Star Trek. But then, 
I showed Lower Decks to a close friend of mine after the season ended, who had only ever seen the Chris Pine Star Trek movies and Star Trek Discovery. And surprisingly, the references didn't turn her off from Lower Decks, but actually made her want to know more about Star Trek. And now she's literally watching Deep Space Nine. It wasn't Star Trek Discovery, which we both liked by the way, but Lower Decks and its own excitement at the Trek mythos that got her to get interested in seeing more of Star Trek. So Lower Decks is actually spreading the love of Star Trek to others who may not have been interested in Star Trek beforehand. You know what's really frightening? If you drink enough of it, you begin to like it. It's insidious. And honestly, this is something that I should have known. I mean, I hear all the time on my own channel in my comments here on YouTube from many of you that have never watched Star Trek that my constant references to the specifics of Star Trek in other things that I'm talking about and my specific excitement about the franchise makes you interested in learning more, even if you know nothing about Star Trek. And specifically, I adore every single time that Lower Decks makes Star Trek Enterprise references. I'm sorry, I'm late. I was watching the first Enterprise on the holodeck. You know, Archer and those guys. What a story. Those guys had a long road getting from there to here. I adore that ugly duckling of the Star Trek franchise that everyone else seems to dislike for some reason, but has only recently been getting a lot of love from the fandom, which makes me oh so happy. Just give me an entire show made up of only Star Trek Enterprise references because I love Star Trek Enterprise so much. Also, I'm realizing as I say that, that a show just of Star Trek Enterprise references would probably just be Star Trek Enterprise and I could just watch Enterprise, but still. Give me more Star Trek Enterprise references, Lower Decks. I want them. I need them. But speaking of that nerdy fan serviceness though, Lower Decks also manages to pay off some things that Star Trek fans have been so desperate for for decades at this point. For example, the USS Titan, captained by none other than Jonathan Frakes' Riker himself, finally gets an on-screen appearance in Star Trek in an awesome sequence. For those of you who don't know, the USS Titan was teased way, way back in the early 2000s by Star Trek Nemesis, when Captain Riker was given command of it. So, where's the Titan off to? The neutral zone. But we never actually got to see it on screen, and because Nemesis bombed, and with the cancellation of Enterprise a few years later, and the live action series today, Star Trek Picard, taking place after Riker had retired from Starfleet, fans felt like we would never be able to actually see the USS Titan on screen despite us really loving it, and figured that we would just have to settle for non-canon books about the fabled ship. Yet here on Lower Decks, it finally gives it to us, and it was goddamn glorious, and I loved it so much, and we're even getting more of it, and it, oh my god, I love this show so much, it has a Titan! Also, there are a few more other treats for Trekkies, and I don't want to spoil them, so that's not the only one, and I'm sure there's going to be more. Also, I adore the animation of the show. I spoke about before how the animation lovingly recreates the live action style of 90s Star Trek, but even more, when it does go beyond that style, with something like a beautiful jellyfish Cosmozoan or the Cerritos literally being terraformed from the inside out, the animation stands out is even more breathtaking than if the show was just as insane as Rick and Morty is in every single frame. Because it recreates the 90s Star Trek style so perfectly, when it does have these big over the top moments, it takes my breath away and makes Star Trek feel bigger than ever. The animation is also so detail oriented, like how in the movie parody episode, the inside of the holodeck stays the same aspect ratio, even as the actual ship in the normal world stays the normal aspect ratio. Also another little tidbit that I love is that many of the background crew members in the show are animated versions of the animators, animating themselves into their own work. All of you animators are fucking amazing and I think that that's so cool that you did that. I love it. Even further, while the bridge crew of the USS Cerritos are more of those broad strokes comedic characters that don't really have a lot of depth to them, they still have arcs and personality. Captain Freeman, played by the amazing Don Lewis, is Mariner's mother, and has an estranged relationship with her daughter that develops throughout the first season. You know, I get what you're trying to do here, and it is sick. I'm doing exactly what I need to. It's called being a captain. No, it's called being a dick. Also, without spoiling too much, the Bajoran tactical officer constantly jokes about wanting to explode something throughout the entire first season. Something is wrong with our shields. They shouldn't be fading this fast. Permission to destroy the enemy ship. Which seems like a silly offhanded joke, but when he finally gets to explode something in the series, I'm not gonna lie, it's honestly kind of a bit of a tearjerker. I am literally not kidding. Watch for yourself and try not to cry when that, that big Bajoran bear gets to finally blow something up and I'm... <laughs> it's so beautiful. Also, First Officer Ransom and Dr. Ta'ana are great too. I mean, Ta'ana is literally all the best parts of McCoy's grouchiness, and I am here for it. Congratulations, you look like a f***ing scratching post. The Chief Engineer character is probably the least interesting of all the characters, but even he has some good moments as well. 
It's also worth saying just for me personally and my own love of Lower Decks is that I really, really love earnest, optimistic comedy. I mean, first off, I just like comedy in general. I love dramas, but if you can't tell from this YouTube channel or the fact that I've trained in and do improv comedy, that I like a little bit of a reverence even for the things that I love. But my favorite types of comedies are when they're done with that earnest optimism, when it's about showing our better sides instead of putting each other down. It's why I love shows like Ted Lasso or Lower Decks, for example. It speaks to my earnest, optimistic heart. I also really love Lower Decks Downbeats. Ever since his time writing the Star Trek Next Generation Twitter account, Mike McMahon spoke about how he loved the downbeats of Star Trek. Those moments where the plot hasn't started yet and the characters just get to exist as themselves for a moment. Picard and Data doing Shakespeare lessons on the holodeck, Bashir and Garrick playing James Bond on the holodeck, Janeway and Seven playing whatever sport this is on the holodeck. Okay, so a lot of downbeats are on the holodeck, but these moments are just little peeks into characters' everyday lives before the actual story of the episode begins. And it's really nice to see them return here in Lower Decks because it just makes me fall in love with these characters more. Ciao, Dendi. Ciao, Dendi. It's something that I've distinctly felt was missing in Star Trek Discovery and Picard, as much as I like those shows, because their episode count is just so much shorter and they're much more plot-focused as series, and so I just like these moments where I get to relate to these characters and get to know them and who they are outside of the big moments of the episode. And finally, one of the last things that I want to mention is that while Lower Decks is episodic, it actually has internal continuity. Star Trek, especially in shows like Voyager and Enterprise, constantly like to hit the reset button every single week, with characters experiencing horrifically traumatic events that are immediately forgotten the next episode. It's as if I have to remind her that she's pregnant. But Lower Decks constantly references and brings back previous elements and actually pays them off well. It's stuff like that that makes me feel like these characters are actually learning and growing and experiencing things in a way that matters. Lower Decks, a comedy show, a genre known for resetting the status quo every single time, does continuity better than some of the actually dramatically focused versions of Trek. I love that Lower Decks has a ton of diversity in its cast, with both Mariner and Captain Freeman being black women, and Rutherford appearing to be of Filipino descent like the actor who portrays him. And yes, Lower Decks can do better in showing more diversity of ethnicity on screen. I think every Star Trek, even Star Trek shows that have done representation better than any other TV show on at the time, can always do better about showing more representation. Yet, within that, to be specific to my own viewpoint, I do think that Lower Decks could do better with LGBTQ representation. As of the end of season one, as far as we know, Lower Decks doesn't have any LGBTQ representation that I'm aware of, though Mike McMahon has teased that Mariner is bisexual, which I'm honestly so here for, it makes sense for her character. But I hope that there's also more than just that character. And also I should say it saddens me that Mariner is being made explicitly bi after she's been mainly played as straight, with many jokes about her being attracted to men being shown in the first season of the show, with none, at least that I could tell, of her being attracted to women. Just because a bisexual person only shows and displays attraction to one gender doesn't mean that they are not bisexual. But the way that Mariner has been depicted reads more like the show is playing her as straight and then realizing that they can make her bi later, instead of her being bisexual the entire time. Star Trek Picard, by the way, did much the same thing with the character of Raffi. I also hope that Lower Decks can show us some trans or non-binary characters too. Trans and non-binary characters who aren't just aliens, but actual humans, and that are explicitly trans and non-binary. Hell, give us some polyamorous or explicitly asexual characters, members of the LGBTQ community that haven't really ever been depicted anywhere else. Now, this isn't me demanding a lot of the show, or saying that it's necessarily an issue with the show as it is, but I just think it would be really cool to see that. But speaking of this, I also think that Lower Decks could also do better about showcasing Star Trek's history of more didactic social progressivism. Lower Decks is absolutely hilarious and comments on Star Trek and does show some Star Trek ideals throughout its entire runtime of the first season, but I don't feel like it ever really had a really socially messaged episode that a lot of other Star Trek shows had. Now this isn't to say that I need every episode of the show to be some big social message or to have Mariner give some big speech at the end just moralizing about an issue. Other Trek shows didn't do that every single episode either, but they did do it from time to time, and Lower Decks hasn't really done that yet. And I think that that is something that's core to what Star Trek is that I think Lower Decks should be doing. It's time any man's freedom is trodden on. We're all damaged. Drumhead! And I also think the show gets so much else right about Star Trek that I trust them to get that right too in their own unique way. 
I also have some minor criticisms here and there with some of the storytelling, like for example how Rutherford and Tendi and Mariner and Boimler are mainly paired off together in storylines, and that I would like to see these characters sort of swapped around and sort of interact with other characters. But from interviews that I've heard, it appears that they're going to address that stuff in future episodes of the series, so I'm kind of excited to see that. Oh, also, Lower Decks understands sexiness better than any other Star Trek show. It's not the skin-tight cat suits or the ripped shirts that make someone sexy. It's being ethical. Now that is hot. Jamaharon! This boy wants Jamaharon! <laughs> but this brings us to the actual episodes themselves. Like previous Trek shows, Lower Decks has a familiar A, B, and C plot structure, with the biggest plot being a typical Trek affair, with the crew having to overcome some big catastrophe or moral dilemma. A zombie outbreak, alien governmental disputes, the bridge crew being put on trial by an alien civilization. Yet these big stories aren't the focus of each episode, but usually the story with the least focus. Instead, the episodes focus on how these big events affect the lives of our four ensigns in smaller ways. For example, in the episode Terminal Provocations, an alien ship firing on the Cerritos makes a holodeck malfunction cause the Microsoft Clippy-inspired Badgie to become homicidal. By the way, Badgie, best thing ever in Star Trek. Best idea ever. I freaking love Badgie so much. I'm going to burn your hearts in a fire! But Badgie becoming homicidal is an absolutely hysterical take on the normal holodeck malfunction episode trope. Yet what I love about these stories most isn't that they're funny or conceptually inspired, though they are but that they're in service of the characters that I was talking about before. For example, in the episode Crisis Point, which is my favorite episode of the series so far, our characters are hanging out in the holodeck playing basically one giant parody of all the Star Trek movie tropes. But it has all the great Star Trek movie stuff that you love and does so in a hilarious way. It has the over-the-top dialogue, the dramatic aspect ratio, bold credits, the over-the-theatrical villain, the crazy warp effects, that's all here. Hell, Mike McMahon for this episode even asked CBS for extra money to make the Starship porn sequence, the sequence that was making fun of the insanely long Enterprise shots from Star Trek The Motion Picture, even longer. Uh, uh, the Cerritos is a handsome lady. You're damn right about that, Boiler. <gasps> Call the ship a handsome lady. Mike McMahon gets Star Trek fans, everyone. But while all that is hilarious and fun, it does so in service of a deep character story. Within this holodeck story, Mariner places herself into the role of villain, killing everyone on the USS Cerritos, at least holographically, for fun. But in the end, comes up against a holographic version of herself. You only break rules because you know that's what everyone expects you to do. If you really were a badass, you'd do the hard thing and just be a good officer. They're not casting you as the villain, you are. And in that moment, Mariner has to reconcile with the fact that, yeah, she actually would sacrifice herself for her others and for the crew if the chips were down. Please, the only person you care about is yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Okay, well then why did I let you kick my ass to buy time for everyone to get off the ship before the self-destruct timer went off? Wait, what? <laughs> This heightened, over-the-top, in-universe parody of Star Trek movies actually, in a uniquely sci-fi way, tells a character story and allows Mariner to understand herself in a way that she hadn't been able to before. And it's also done in one of the funniest, most insane Star Trek episodes ever. Lower Decks may be a comedy, but it's a comedy that is in service of the universe and characters, not at the expense of it. And even further, Lower Decks evolves these character arcs in uniquely Star Trek ways. In the episode Envoys, Mariner and Boimler lose their Klingon diplomat that they're supposed to be ferrying on a Disney Epcot-like planet. Not only does this allow for cool Star Trek settings as both Mariner and Boimler look for their diplomat, but also highlights how Mariner and Boimler distinctly try to deal with the situation. Boimler tries to use his Starfleet training in an overconfident manner, yet ultimately fails, unable to handle a situation outside of a Starfleet training manual. Mariner, being more worldly though, is able to get everything under control by herself. I've never once seen you study, but then you just breeze in here, knowing cool plant tricks and which aliens are which? How? Dude, I told you I've been places. I just pick stuff up along the way. I could never do that. I guess I'm just not cut out for Starfleet. Oh, please, you're Mr. Starfleet. No, I'm not. Not like you are. I should just turn in my uniform and go work on a research asteroid. <gasps> no, absolutely not. Do not even joke about that. That is the lamest thing you can do. Yet instead of doing it all by herself, she lets Boimler figure out the situation and pushes him in the right direction, encouraging him without being overbearing or even allowing Boimler to know that she's doing it. She even pretends to get things wrong in order to let Boimler feel like he's succeeded. 
she begins to allow Boimler to have confidence in himself to face failure and thus grow from it, and therefore grow as a person and a Starfleet officer. And this is what I love the most about Star Trek in general and Lower Decks specifically, because Mariner and Boimler build off each other, help each other. It would be so easy to have these characters fight and hate each other like other dramatic shows do, but Star Trek has always been about working together to build each other up, humanity coming together to make ourselves better than our distinct parts, but greater in the whole. That's the Starfleet way, and Lower Decks is showing that. I love that Lower Decks takes character arcs that we've seen before and pushes them in ways that are uniquely Trek. Mariner and Boimler have conflict, yes, but they actually want to help each other rather than push each other down. Tendi and Rutherford do much the same, encouraging each other's excitements and fixations instead of shaming each other for them or saying that they need to expand out from them. They're allowed to just be hyper-competent nerds, and that's awesome. The show avoids the typical comedy approach of having comedy drawn from characters putting each other down, but from learning how best to help each other, sometimes failing or missing the mark, but still trying. And that's the Star Trek way, to strive to be more than we are, both as individuals and through community, even if we never reach our ultimate goal. The effort yields its own reward. <laughs> Okay, so I am filming this late at night. I have had a few beers and uh, I've been watching a movie, but I've also been editing this video about Lower Decks all day, the video that hopefully you're currently watching. And as I was watching it, as I was editing, I was like, I love this. This is a really good essay. It's very thoughtful. It's getting across my like deep nuanced thoughts about this Star Trek show, about Lower Decks, about what Lower Decks is. I think it's a very intelligent essay. However, as I was editing, I'm like, but I'm not getting across the excitement that I have for this show. So I am currently very drunk and sober, Jesse. You better have the... you. This might seem weirdly transphobic to myself, but you better have the balls to put this section into the video itself because I just I just need to express to you, audience, that like this is a very thoughtful essay. Star Trek Lower Decks is a very really deeply nuanced comedic show. It, its comedy is written so wonderfully and like it's just so deeply nuanced. But also, can I just say how much I love this show? I just want to get across the excitement that I have at the show because like it is like Star Trek distilled as a Star Trek fan who has loved Star Trek my whole life and loves the nerdy, geeky nuances of it and like the weirdly specifics of it who reads like so many Star Trek books. I have, I've been reading Star Trek since I was like, whenever Star Trek Nemesis came out, I was probably like 12 or something. Since I was 12 years old, Star Trek has been like the thing that meant so much to me and Star Trek Lower Decks is like the first Star Trek show that like is just like, oh my god, isn't Star Trek so cool too? And I'm like, yes, yes, Star Trek is so cool too. And it's like the show and me are like on this level of like, oh my god, I love Star Trek so much. It's like the best thing in the freaking world. And like, yes, I love my Deep Space Nine. It's a very thoughtful content about like the wars that you can face in the uh, utopian future and like the how can we keep our utopian soul, but there's wars going on. And then you have Voyager, which is like, I am a woman is the captain and I'm going to kick butt as the woman is the captain because women deserve to be able to be the captain and screw you freaking SJW nonsense ranters like women can be captains too like that's Voyager and you have Next Generation which Picard's like I'm going to make a speech and then you have Enterprise is like this weird little strange amalgam show that's like <laughs> not very great but dear god is it weird and I love it and it's like all those are the Star Treks that I love and also you have the sexist Kirk but like uh, <laughs> but this show it just gets all of it and I love it I love it so much Star Trek Lower Decks is literally the best and I just had to drunkenly rant about it because I feel like the excitement that I feel at the show was not necessarily coming across in this video. Everything I'm saying in this video is like really thoughtful. It is totally accurate. Like Lower Decks is all of these smart, intelligent things, but I also just needed to be like, fuck this show. I love this show so much. It's so good. And I wanted to make sure that that was expressed in this video somewhere. So drunken me to sober me, please put this in the video. Anyways, I'm going to go do other things now. <laughs> Star Trek has consistently been my favorite franchise throughout my entire life, not just because of its stories or its optimistic takes on the future that inspires me to be better, but because of how many who make the show also work towards that future in their everyday lives. So many of Star Trek's cast and crew throughout its history have gone on to be activists, like George Takei for the LGBTQ and Japanese American communities, or Kate Mulgrew for women in STEM, or Leonard Nimoy just being a warm soul and a constant advocate for others. Sonequa Martin-Green and Nichelle Nichols are great advocates with the black community as well. And these are just a few of many in Star Trek who have done this. 
And yes, it's important to recognize that there are some who worked on Star Trek who expressly went against its ideals. And to say that Star Trek has completely managed to avoid some of the worst aspects of Hollywood in the entertainment industry, especially in a post-Me Too world, would be to erase the very real and horrible homophobia, racism, and sexism that many experience behind the scenes on the franchise. But on the whole, Star Trek breeds kindness and community from its cast and crew more than any other franchise that I've seen, and that's why I absolutely love it. And that comes not just from the story that Star Trek tells, but from the people themselves who work on it. And Lower Decks is no different. I mean, firstly, when the cast and crew do panels, they all seem to really love each other and it just warms my heart. Energizing, energizing, energizing. Uh -huh. Energizing. Oh, yeah. yeah. When in the history of Starfleet has it taken that long? Maybe an Enterprise, maybe Archer and them, maybe they took that long. This took a very long time to bean up. Yeah, explain. I have a bad knee, so when I was coming okay. up, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Mike, now every yeah. time Ransom uh, beams anywhere in the show, can he? Can we animate him going energizing, energizing, energizing? That so uh, beaming used to be glitter in a jar, and they would swirl <laughs> it and hold a flashlight under it. But that's because oh. they haven't seen Jerry's transportation beam, oh, right. which is really, I was shocked because I was like, it's how did we afford that? Whoa, wait, oh. <laughs> I didn't know we had an SFX budget for this panel. It's amazing. Oh. To be honest, also, it's <laughs> um, inside jazz hands. Oh, that's yeah. Also, I don't know why Jerry O'Connell, who plays Ransom, is always apparently off in the park somewhere during these panels, but dear God, do I love that he is. Even further, Don Lewis, along with Star Trek Picard's Michelle Hurd and Star Trek Discovery's Sequel Martin Green, have also talked constantly about black representations in media and in Star Trek. Similarly, Tawny Newsom, who plays Mariner, and comedian Paula Tompkins, who also appears in Lower Decks, are the hosts of the official Star Trek podcast and are constantly hilarious, yet also use the show to platform activists and members of the Trekkie community. Just proportionally, uh, yeah. it, it just seems like there are a lot more like otherworldly aliens than actual people of Asian descent. It I recently listened to an episode of your pod, All the Asians on Star Trek, uh, the interview you did with Rosalind Chow, who played Keiko O'Brien in both TNG and DS9. I love that talk so much. I, I don't think I've ever heard an interview with her before. And hearing you talk about how she was the one of the first Asian faces that you got to see on TV you know, from different strokes, from her work in Joy Luck Club, like one of the most prominent people that you got to, you know, really identify with on screen. It was a really cool conversation. And both of them also encourage folks, both listening to the podcast and on it, to be critical of all forms of Star Trek, using both the love and critiques of the franchise to fuel honest conversations about representation, politics, social issues, and even more. That if you grow up like me, or you're just used to seeing people that look like you all the time. I had no shortage of, of role models. I had no shortage of of characters that I could identify with, even if they weren't, you know, exactly like me personality wise, I had like, I had people to choose from, you know, and say that guy's my favorite, you know, out of mm -hmm. all the, out of all the white characters. We, you know, we, we both are able to be critical and complimentary of the franchise just because it's an official pod doesn't mean we can't like, you know, say our true feelings about stuff. And I do feel like the franchise has been better about certain groups. Like I've certainly seen better black representation than we have other groups. And I, I know it's something that they still work on and strive for. And thank goodness every day it feels like 40 new shows get greenlit. So, <laughs> you know, there's plenty of room to to rectify some of that. It's so rare to see a franchise embrace self-critique in this way. And it's why I think Star Trek continues to endure for over 50 years, because it is willing to recognize that it's not perfect, that it sometimes fails. And that is a fact that Lower Deck, both as a show in general, but also within its cast and crew, helps enable in the conversation. And I think that's freaking awesome. The folks behind Lower Decks live what it means to be Star Trek, and it even affects me personally. If you follow me on Twitter, some of you may remember that a few months ago I mentioned on Twitter that I was having, honestly, a kind of really bad panic attack one day because of some of the hate that I was experiencing doing, due to the fact that I talk about anti-transgender hate groups. And they were coming at me with bigotry and hate and honestly, um, just the fact that I have to constantly think about that was that day causing me to just really break down and have a really, 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 really shitty day to the point where I hadn't slept all night and had been crying for several hours because of how overwhelmed emotionally I was. And like I said, I mentioned that on Twitter, and of all people, Mike McMahon himself tweeted at me a 
picture of Kirk throwing a rock at a Gorn. And then after that said, sometimes you just gotta throw a foam rock at your troubles. Honestly, wise and sage advice. And I know it's silly, I know it's dumb, I know it's just a really small thing, but that tweet took a really, really shitty day and made it one of the most memorable. I mean, the showrunner of my favorite Star Trek show took time to show me specifically kindness and support on a day I was dealing with hate and bigotry. Hate and bigotry that still scares me to this day. I can't tell you how much that means. For those of you who haven't had to worry that the creator of a fiction property that you really care about might come out as expressly bigoted towards the community that you're a part of, I really, really cannot express how much Mike's tweet meant to me on that level and on that day. Because now I know one of the people behind the thing that I really love supports me and supports my community and supports my community in the face of these things. Believe me, as someone who experienced the betrayal of JK Rowling, that means way more than you think it would. But more importantly, it means a lot on a human level, a personal one. He just cared and made me feel better. And I know it's just a simple tweet, I know I'm making a big deal out of it, but honestly it meant a lot to me that day and I'm never going to be able to forget that. I just like knowing that the people who make the things that I care about not only care about the thing that I care about, but also care about the people who enjoy it, too. At the beginning of this video, I shared the story of how Mike McMahon was able to get to create Lower Decks, because I think his story shows what makes the series as a whole so powerful. It's not because his story is some crazy unique one, showing his amazing work as a creator, but I shared his story because of how relatable it is. A person who started from the Lower Decks, who was inspired by the values and ideas of something greater than himself, to work his way to the bridge crew, to run his own Star Trek show, and that's what we all want to do in our own way. Be inspired by something and want to work our way to getting to show it in the world. It's what the characters of Lower Decks do themselves trying to uphold the values of Starfleet in their own ways, even sometimes failing. It's why these characters are so relatable. I mean, I worked in in Hollywood, I guess, so to speak, for like 11 years before I got my first writing job. And I was writing at home all the time. I was, I was getting people coffee. I was working as an assistant. I was a production assistant. I was a writer's assistant. Like, I did a lot of Lower Decks jobs before I started moving up and getting to do the kind of stuff I wanted to do. And I, I think it different, you know, when you do something for a decade, you are different people. Like you change as you go, as you're growing up and as, as you're experiencing different stuff and getting more experience. And I think to some extent, like when I first started, I was attendee, like everything was amazing. I, there was literally like, I was a PA at South Park and there was nothing that I had to do that sucked. Clean the bathrooms today? Fuck yeah, let's go, I'm at <laughs> South Park, you know? And, <laughs> And then, yeah. you know, for for some of it, I was like Mariner, you know, like, this is bullshit. I should do what I want. I can do this better. You have that kind of like bravado of youth that you think everything, that you think you have a better way of doing stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I know how to use Photoshop. Why are we using whiteout strips on this thing? Like, <laughs> um, And then other times I was like Rutherford, you know, where it's like you come into a room and, and you're brand new and you know how to use technology and, and you're learning the old way, but you're also bringing in the new way. And, and then... Probably, unfortunately, I'm the most like Boimler because I'm I'm super excited to be there. I get in my own way. I talk a little bit too much. I know what I'm doing, but I get under my own feet a little bit. I trip myself up mm -hmm. and that you have to like, like Boimler, I had to find people like Mariner and like the other folks on the ship that you have to extend this trust. Like it can't all be on you. You can't be your own worst enemy all the time. Even further though, Mike McMahon didn't get to where he is alone. He worked really hard and that matters. But he got there because of the folks who shared his Twitter threads, like Will Wheaton, or the Trekkie community who loved his work and bought his book. He also regularly collaborated with writers, like, for example, Justin Roiland on the show Solar Opposites and Rick and Morty. Alex Kurtzman and others helped to give Mike McMahon the chance to run his own Star Trek show. And when Mike McMahon got the show, he also hired a bunch of writers and cast and crew and animators who helped build and create Lower Decks that all worked together in a writer's room and as a crew and a cast to make the show that we love and he built upon the community and love of a Trek fandom that already existed and that he was a part of to share love, kindness, caring, and optimism through the show itself and behind the scenes. And even in all of that, he isn't unique, but is doing what Star Trek showrunners, writers, creators, and fans have always done. 
build a world together through a shared love of a weird little sci-fi franchise. Lower Decks on the surface looks like a show that could have easily been the worst thing Trek ever created. A quick parody making fun of a franchise that means so much to so many. It could have been easily done. Yet instead, it became a show that did exactly the opposite. It showed us Star Trek from an angle that was always missing, yet was equally important to what makes that universe so wonderful. That the people who are at the bottom of Star Trek are not forgotten and still love the ideals that Star Trek stands for and strives for them not through self-aggrandizement, but by working together to help each other improve and grow. It's about saying that we are all still as much a part of making the bright future of humanity and that we do it by working together no matter what part that we have to play, whether we're the bridge crew or the lowest ensign on a ship. It's what Star Trek and now Lower Decks have always been about. You know, you don't want to betray anybody, but you do have to do something new. You know, like Deep Space Nine had to do something new, Voyager did something new, Enterprise. Every one of these shows does something new. It's always, is do, do, are you doing something new without betraying the Star Trek-ishness of it? And for me, Lower Decks doesn't betray Star Trek. I mean, we bend Star Trek rules. We're obviously a comedy, but at its heart, this show is Star Trek. All that being said, I still want the tentacle porn, though. Bring me the tentacle porn, Mike McMahon. Jamaharon! This boy wants Jamaharon! <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you so much for watching this video. I know it was a really long one, but I honestly just needed to self-care and rant about how much I loved Lower Decks, and I hope that it inspired at least one or two of you to go and watch the show if you decided not to give it a chance or not even are a Trekkie in any way. I think Lower Decks is a great place to start with Star Trek if you're not a fan of the franchise at all. Um, but anyways, I know this was an overly indulgent video, but I just needed to rant about how much I love the show. Um, so thank you so much for following me along in that. Also, I wanted to do my Tendi cosplay. And like I said, I totally bombed the, the hair. I think I got everything else pretty decently right, um, but I totally bombed the hair. It's like, it's all matted and weird and awful. <laughs> So uh, I will have to do that better when I actually go to uh, when I actually go to conventions in Tendi cosplay. Um, but it was a lot of fun to do. I hope you at least enjoyed the the kind of Tendi look that I managed to do. Also, really quickly, I forgot to mention while I was in the makeup. If you're really really jonesing for more of me gushing about how much I love Star Trek Lower Decks, my friend and I are going to be doing a podcast called Drawn to Trek, where we're going to be reviewing each and every episode of Lower Decks, as well as talking about some of the news around Lower Decks and stuff like that. And that podcast feed is already up, and we've already done a couple episodes about Lower Decks. So go check that out. It's wherever you can find your podcasts. Also, I'll be doing individual episode reviews right here on this YouTube channel. So look for that when new episodes of Lower Decks drops. I am so excited for this new season. It's going to be amazing. Uh, and I look forward to enjoying it with you. Thank you so much for watching this. Don't forget to subscribe. I also have a Patreon that you can help support me at. Um, all that other stuff. But beyond all of that, thank you so much for watching. I hope that you, as always, live long and prosper. Patreon, the final frontier. These are the names of the patrons who help me explore strange new videos, seek out new topics, and boldly go where no YouTuber has gone before. Morgan the Pirate Queen, Joe Herman Holt, Miranda Janelle, Eli Berg Maas, Liz Lee Roberts, Kathleen LaBeth, Ashley Allen, Bo Kikio, D. Cassowary, Stephen Kleinard, Jem Shin, Alex Miller, Ish the Mad, Randy Thompson, Wellington Marcus, Boyd and Mary Beth Earl, Man Chooses, A Slave Obeys, Base. Mary Mello, April Struck, Joseph Dewey, Felicia Toast, Bush, James Krivda, Barbara Ruski, Dominic Noble, Ulia Kai Gooch, Stefan Shuthart, Buttonier, Mina Carroll, Jessica Wright, Peter Landers, Jared Johnson, Bar Rangito, John Steele, Barba Heelchuk, Celestial Dawn, Geek Filter, John Weatherby, Janie Packard, Pissed and Twisted Garage, Melinda Walters, Eva Keneva, Sky Dodo, Ulysses the Pagan, W. Randy E.D., Meadow Whisper, Beatrix Purvis, Alex Owen, Lysa, Keith Briggs, Tiffany Danger, Jedi, Indiana Jones, Gretchen Badger, Flynn, Odd, Just Odd, Lamia, Amelia Loomis, Maggie the Goblin, Kayliss, William Stewart, Chloe Dollar, Sarah Byston, Jessica Chapman, Noble Monster Comics, Andrew Lamoureux, Mary Mack, Nathan Steele, Jacob Tovar, Laura Demero, Heuresis, Jason Knott, The Author 13, Sean Piper, Sky Skinner, Polly Mina, Troy Stahl, Lily, Maeve Munir Online, Strawberry Pup Tart, Andrew K, Nikki Gordon Bloomfield, Mountain Harpy, Shrib Machine Berlin, Amanda Roni Adania, Angie Push, Alan Badapple, Zone One Librarian, Michael Godey, Jenny Marble, Pasty, Michael Hardy Burr, Philip Hawkins, Andrew H., Mark Brown, There's My Shoulder, Corey and Vale, Honkinen. I love you all. Thank you all so much for being wonderful and supporting me doing this. I cannot thank you enough.